this video I'm going to be focused on the electrical wiring to the cooler and inside the cooler. At the end of this video there is detailed wiring diagrams, charts, and parts lists. And there's a part 5 for even further details. Now even if you're a DC electrical wiring whiz, I've got some different techniques and methods that might be helpful to see. So most of the wiring all comes back to this control box and these four connectors. So I have to decide which type of wire terminal I need to use. There's the open spade type and this closed loop type. I'm going with this one because it's got a bigger, broader electrical footprint and if it ever comes loose it won't fall off. These are all for the same wire size range but they're obviously for different size screws. I want the smallest hole that'll still fit my screw and it might seem like that one but actually I like this one better because it's got a wider bigger footprint. Some of the wire connections are going to be soldered and here's the equipment. For smaller I'll use the electric gun. For bigger I'll use the propane torch. Got to use real 6040 tin lead rosin core flux solder for electrical work. I do not want to use flux made for plumbing. If you've ever done any automobile wiring you'd be familiar with these items. One thing I've learned over the years is it's wise to invest in a good high quality wire stripper, especially for the crimping. So up to this point it's all pretty standard. Strip off the insulation, load the wire in there, and select which slot to use according to the wire size. Cradle it in there, squeeze down and crimp it. But I don't do it this way anymore. I've seen that over time the copper can become corroded, the wire can come loose, and you lose the electrical connection. So what I do is gently grab the blue plastic and twist the center metal core out. What I want is the core and I'm going to toss the blue insulator. Then I proceed to crimp it in the conventional way, only now there's no blue plastic insulator. Here's the new way I do it. I go this extra step and use solder to strongly bond the two pieces together. And to replace the blue plastic, I use this heat shrink tubing. It looks too big, but then you heat it up and it shrinks down. Sometimes I'll even install a second layer or even a third layer over this first layer if I want extra insulating. You heat each one up first and slide another one on. Now to get the core out of these wire splicers, so I just grab them with a pair of pliers and use a utility knife, make a few scores across there, and then push the core out. This proceeds on just as before. I need to point out that the solder will not fully bond to copper that is tarnished. So if the copper wires don't look bright and shiny like a brand new penny, I'll take sandpaper and work them till they do. To splice wires that can easily be taken apart again, I use these, male and a female. They come apart pretty easy and go together firm. I do the same process with these as I've shown before. The other thing is I slide a second longer piece of shrink tubing past the end so that when they go together there's no exposed metal to short out on anything. My cooler is 40 feet away from my batteries so I've got to use a much larger wire diameter to keep the voltage from dropping too much. Voltage drop in long runs of wire becomes more an issue the lower the power supply voltage is to begin with, 12 volt being worse than 24 and the problem grows as the amperage increases. I figured out what size wire I needed by using one of these wire loss charts. They're at the end of this video. 
This is for a 12 volt system, but mine's 24, so I'll use that. So my system uses approximately 8 amps max, and I'm going 40 feet, so I should be using at least 8 gauge wire. It could be bigger wire, but 8's the minimum to keep my voltage drop at 2%. If I wanted to save a little money on the wire, I could use the next smaller size. It wouldn't hurt anything, just the fan and the pump would run a little bit slower. I should note that the larger the wire gets, the smaller the gauge number goes. You can see this is all a bigger scale than what I've been showing up to now. There's no opening here big enough for this wire, so I just gently squeeze it in the largest opening and twist around and pull off the insulation. I don't want to cut into the wire. Sometimes the shrink tube won't fit over the end, so I've got to put it on first. For crimping, I use this very inner center part of a regular pair of pliers. And I put the pliers down on a firm surface and push hard down on the handle. Then I turn it around the other way and do it again. Then from here on out it's just like the smaller ones except the soldering gun will not heat this up so I use the torch. By the way this larger terminal is to connect to my batteries. This is another common way to splice wires together. Twist on wire connectors. The advantage is you can take them back apart real easy if you're changing something. But the bare copper corrosion is a problem in this wet environment, so this is a paste that helps minimize the corrosion. Same on the connection to the battery. In a pinch, I've used wheel bearing grease. I often use this split flex tubing or split loom to give wire runs an extra bit of protection. And sometimes you can slide the wire through it, sometimes you gotta just weave it on like this. It's a common auto parts store item. Another wire protector, rubber grommets. You use them when you're gonna pass wires through a barrier, especially one that's sharp metal. When I buy them, I look for the inside diameter that I need to pass the wires through, but then also there's an outside diameter, and that's the hole size that has to be drilled. Here's where I'm using a grommet in the project, and it's 3 8 outside diameter, quarter inch inside diameter, and I'm passing three number 14 gauge wires through to the pump and the float switch. And here they are passing down through. The black wire is common to both the pump and the float switch, so instead of cutting it for each, I'm just going to take the insulation off and wrap the float switch wire around it. Then I'll solder it, slide down a long piece of shrink tubing, and shrink it. Then I'll take the blue wire that came through the grommet and hook it to the other float switch wire. I'm loading on two pieces of shrink tubing. Then I solder the wires, shrink one tube on, slide the other one up, and shrink it on. To protect these wires even further, I'm going to install a short piece of the split flex tubing up to the grommet here. But now the black and the red wire continue on to the pump, and it's a long run. So I'm also going to cover it with some split flex tubing. To support it along the way, I'm going to add a plastic cable clamp about midway. And because it's plastic, I can't really tighten down the nut real tight, so I'm going to use a nylon insert type lock nut. That cable clamp is right up underneath there, and I'm making this wire run extra long just in case. That's where the pump goes. To route the wires coming out of the fan motors, I'm going to take them across one of the existing ribs and use cable ties to secure it, leaving some slack up as it goes into the motor. There it is trimmed off, and I'm going to use the twist-on type wire connectors. So this setup is all wired in and ready for the box chute installation. Here's the front control panel with the pump switch and the two lights installed. 
and you'll notice that I'm using the factory knob which doesn't fit the controller speed switch. The reason it does now is because I replaced the stock one with a heavier duty version. But either way, I need to install a grommet where these wires come in and out of the box. But I'll have to slice the grommet open to get it over the wires. And then it sits down in a rectangular groove that looks just like this one. It's already there. Here's the factory switch box mounted back in where it originally came from. But you see the wires and the grommet. There's the speed control unit, and there's the adjusting rheostat for the pump output mounted in a piece of aluminum angle. This is what it really looks like. Mine hadn't come in the mail yet, so I was using a substitute. It can get warm during use. This is the float switch relay, and that's where I'm going to place it roughly. Notice where the green arrow is pointing on the circuit board, which has the labeling for which wires go where. Don't want to mix them up. Fans could run backwards, sucking air out of my house instead of blowing it in. Things could get fried and ruined. But even when this unit is connected correctly, and say I'm testing some fans temporarily with jumper wires, the final power connection wire will make a big snapping spark and that's okay it's just charging up the capacitors inside but I wouldn't want to make that last sparking final connection near any charging lead acid batteries the batteries outgassing hydrogen could explode there's another little quirk thing about this controller I should mention at some slower speeds the fan motors will make this clicking sound. It doesn't appear to be harmful, but I try and avoid it by going a little faster or a little slower on the fan speed adjustment. Here's the fan wires going up towards the control box, and then these are the ones out of the grommet over into this area. This is an overall picture of that area. These are the wires coming out to the front control panel. The lights are polarity sensitive, so the red has to go to the positive or they won't work. Now I'm beginning to wire in the switch and the two lights. This is one of the resistors that goes to the lights, as shown in the wiring diagrams at the end. It's not good for these parts to get too hot, so the soldering should get done on and off real quick and then smother it immediately with a wet paper towel to cool it off. Also, the power cord comes in here and it has these restrictions for strain relief, but I'm doing that elsewhere and these make it really hard to put the cord in and the cover back on, so I'm going to cut these off. Here's the front panel pretty much ready to go. You'll see I'm using a variety of different connection methods, so I can't mix them up as easy. And some mini cable ties to keep things neat. Now I've joined the front panel wiring with the rest of it. Everything's way too long, but I like being able to pull the things away so I can work on it. Gotta take care not to pinch any of the wires when I put the front cover back on. Got to tuck it all in real careful like this. Most of the slack is folded up under the switch box. This is ready to put back on. I mounted this pump output adjustment in a place where I can get to it with needle nose pliers, but no one else is going to know it's there. For my pump model and this cooler, I turned it a bit past halfway to slow my pump down, adjusting it later if needed. The fan control box has a little red LED light on it. That's what's glowing back in there. Here's the factory plumbing installed back in just like it was. But going down to the pump, that clear vinyl tubing that I used has its own natural curve that's hard to fight. So I just cut it off where it finally got vertical and then cut the gray tube shorter to fit, pushing them together right there. 
the goal being to get the pump to sit naturally just square and flat on the bottom. When I connected my wires to the pump's wires, I left the pump wires as long as possible so the splices would be well above the water line and I cut one longer than the other so the two splices wouldn't be side by side in the split loom. And the pump has to be hooked up correctly or it could be damaged. On this model, the red and blue wires hook together and connect to battery positive. The black wire goes to battery negative. And the yellow wire, it doesn't go anywhere, so I just tie it off. I don't ever want to run this pump without a filter screen on the inlet. I just took a piece off the old original pump, cut it out, and put it on there with some cable ties. The screen is several layers thick and the end is folded over. Window screening fiberglass type could be used instead. I'm using the cooler's original power cord and I need to mate it to the long 40 foot run of big number 8 wire that's coming from my batteries. So this 60 amp outdoor rated disconnect box does the job nicely with the added benefit of being able to pull the connector and disconnect my power. Notice that one of the white cooler power wires has red tape on it. It has to be marked on both ends to designate positive so that the power is never hooked up backwards. The main fuse should always be installed as close as can be to the power source, in this case my batteries. I'm using DC rated circuit breakers, but either way it's the same. Now what's this? The pump switch is on but it's flashing low water. I've got to fill it up with water, turn the switch back off, try it again. Ah, you can hear the sound. Well, I got the back off here just so you can see what's going on. When you put new wooden Aspen cooling pads in, it always kind of makes the water a little brownish. And there's been some little flying bugs got in there from the back being off, but get the general idea. You can see if the water's flowing down through all the pads. I'll drain it and fill it again. Add a cap of laundry bleach. Thank you.